Okay, it will, it will. Yes. Good Thank afternoon, you. everyone. Uh, welcome to join the Ryukoku International Seminar today. Uh, I'm the Hongbinun, uh, and also the, I do uh, the MC today. Uh, my name is Mitsuya Dake, of uh, professor, professor at the, uh, the Parker University of the in International Studies and also the, uh, the, the researcher at the Center for the World Buddhist Culture at Ryukoku University. Today, uh, I'm very we are very fortunate to have two uh, eminent scholars from France. Strasbourg University in France. And uh, we are going to have their presentation first, and then uh, we will ask the Professor uh, Mitani of Duke of University to comment uh, to their presentation. And then uh, probably we have time to have the QA question and answer, especially uh, th those people who join this uh, seminar online. So let me uh, briefly introduce to guest speaker today, Professor Kimion Juko is a professor at Strasbourg University in France. Uh, specialized in comparative his, history of religion, especially speci specifically in South Asian religion, including Buddhism. He's uh, going to uh, talk about the the the, the 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 his title is the prototype of the ancient Rushi and the constructive fear of the Buddha in Diana. And, and, oh, well, yes, I should have uh, introduced his CV. I'm sorry about that. He, he was graduated from the, uh, the University of Paris, uh, uh, Sorbonne, uh, and He's uh, well versed in uh, the South Asian uh, religious religions and history, and I had an occasion to meet him uh, before pandemic, and now, well, we have a, a, a lack to have here in Japan uh, to give us a, a lecture today. And next speaker, I mean, uh, uh, next guest speaker is a professor. John Kong Kim. Uh, he's also the, uh, the, uh, the, the professor at the uh, University of, of Strasbourg. He was, he, he, he is originally from Korea, but he graduated from, he finished his uh, doctor course at doctor, uh, doctor study at the, in, in Germany. Uh, uh, he obtained the title of Diploma Theology at the University of Mainz and Doctor of Theology at the University of Bonn. And now he his position at the University of, uh, of Strasbourg. And he's going to give us a talk about, sorry, The Eugene Burun and research on Indian Buddhism, who is very famous, uh, the Buddhist Buddhologist, and also very famous in Japan as the you know lots of Japanese or uh, the modern young scholar went to France and they learned from his disciple. <laughs> his, uh, and so he, he's kind of uh, the you know, the original father of the Japanese Buddhist studies, I think. 
Anyway, today uh, we want to start from the presentation by Professor Kim. And I'd like to ask Professor Kim to present your presentation. Thank you very much. Before I begin my presentation, I would like to thank Professor Take and Professor Iwai for their invitation, which allows me to present some observations on the research of Yujin Gyeongnuk, who, as a professor of Sanskrit literature and language at the Collège de France, had left an immense and brilliant intellectual legacy to posterity. So it is a great honor for me to give here today a presentation about Vyonov's research on Indian Buddhism exposed in his two monumental biological works. Uh, maybe introduction, introduction à l'histoire du bouddhisme indien, introduction to the history of Indian Buddhism and the lotus, lotus de la bonne loi, the lotus of good love. More especially, we will consider today two questions. One in relation to Pionov's contribution to pathology and the other concerning the reasons for his choice of the Satama Pundarika Sutta for its complete translation into the French language among the 88 Nepalese Buddhist manuscripts received by the Asiatic Society of Paris in 1837. In fact, even if Bernard's philological and historical approach to Buddhism has widely been recognized by Buddhologists and Indianists of later generations as the edifying method of Buddhist studies, as we can see in the following quotations, the observation on the case of his analysis on the notion of Arhat will help us to appreciate more his research method. Then, concerning the question about reasons for Bjorn's choice of the Satama Pundarika Sutta, it probably seems to have attracted any special attention from scholars as we could identify only two reflections on this matter. However, I suppose that the consideration of this matter may enable to better understand the correlation between these two monumental pedagogical works, Introduction à l'histoire du Bouddhisme and Le Lotus de la Loi. La bonne loi. So, as you can guess, my presentation is divided in two main parts. To begin, I'd like to focus on the question why Bernou wanted to present a French translation of the Satama Pindarika Sutta as the first complete work and not another one, because we know that the composition of his introduction to the history of Indian Buddhism was planned with the aim of making intelligible his translation of Sanskrit Buddhist texts, including that of the Satama Pindarika Sutta. By the way, in order to better understand the historical meaning of this foundational work, introduction to the history of Indian Buddhism, from a Buddhological point of view, we can remind that the fact of the birth of Buddhism in India and its progressive diffusion outside India were hardly evident in the West, at least until the 17th century. Unlike in the Far East, 
Well, the Indian origin of Buddhism was well known from its introduction during the first half of the first millennium of the Celtic era. For example, various diffusion reflections on the uh, incompatibility of this foreign doctrine with Chinese culture or the travel account of Chinese pilgrim monks, such as Ba Xin, Xin Zhang, the eating, to demonstrate the knowledge of our Easterners about the Indian origin of Buddhism. Certainly, for the Christian Europe interested in the expansion of this, its influence on foreign territories and in the conversion of the idolaters to Christianity, the acquirement of knowledge on the culture and the history of the unknown peoples like the Buddhist doctrine and practices was hardly the object of their major consideration. Actually, it was from the 18th century onward that a few rare European scholars began to study Buddhism, either thanks to the cultural and linguistic information provided by European missionaries and administrators sent to Asia in previous centuries or during their own stay in most Buddhist countries. Thus, various introductory words appeared from this time. For example, the three long articles of Joseph Beguinian, professor at Collège Royal in Paris, the article of the Scottish doctor, Francis Buchanan, on the religion and literature of the Gomers. The essay of the French polygrapher Michel Jean Francois Trey, research on Voodoo, religious teacher of Eastern Asia. The life of Buddha according to the Mongolian books by German scholar Julius von Lacroix. The History and Doctrine of Buddhism by Edward Upton of the Royal Asiatic Society. The author analysis of the Tulpa portion of the Tibetan work entitled Kyagi by the Hungarian Orientalist Sando Shima Kirish. The Book of Qi, translated by the French sinologist uh, Jean-Pierre Abel Maniza. The first English translation of the Sinhalese Chronicle Mahabansa by George Tunnel, a British official in Salem, etc. However, None of these studies dealt directly with India or with Sanskrit Buddhist texts. Indeed, since Buddhism has almost disappeared from the religious landscape of India by the beginning of the second millennium, European travelers, missionaries, and administrators became aware of Buddhism outside its cradle and through texts composed in various languages other than Sanskrit. The only exception was the case of Brian Hutton Hodgson, a British administrator in Nepal, who discovered the Buddhism practice in the newer community living in the Kathmandu Valley. Hodgson arrived in 1821 in this Hindu kingdom which he named Bauda country. 
as early as in 1821, excuse me, 1824, with the help of a neighbor sage named Henri Fernandez, Hodgson mm -hmm. began to collect Sanskrit Buddhist manuscripts and jointly published several articles on Nepalese Buddhism and Sanskrit Buddhist manuscripts, like sketch and Buddhism derived from the Bauder scripture of Nepal, etc. Actually, Hodgson considered the Sanskrit Buddhist text as the very source of the Buddhist documents which were translated in other Buddhist countries. Moreover, moreover Hodgson took the initiative of sending some 423 Nepalese Buddhist manuscripts composed in Sanskrit to various libraries in Calcutta, London, Oxford, and Paris in order to invite European scholars to discover Indian Buddhism from these unpublished source texts. Thus, the British Sanskritist Horace Heyman Wilson, Secretary of the Asiatic Society of Calcutta, was able to present in his notices of three facts received from the art, three Buddhist treatises supplied by Hodgson. As for Jean Biono, he already manifested his interest in Buddhism in the world through edited by Christian Lassen, essay on the Pali or sacred language of the peninsula beyond the Ganges. And as secretary of the Society, Society uh, of Paris, you know, voluntarily accepted in 1934 Hodgson's proposal to acquire copies of Sanskrit Buddhist manuscripts for the Society. In the same year, Bionov expressed Hodgson his desire to translate some of the most important Buddhist books composed in Sanskrit, even before the reception of the Nepalese manuscripts. Then, around April 20, 1837, Bionov could finally discover Buddhist text composed in an Indian language other than Pali, notably the 24 Sanskrit Buddhist manuscripts, and three months later, copies of 64 other Nepalese Buddhist manuscripts. Bionov's reaction was very enthusiastic because he was in search of the origin of pure Buddhism, which is not contaminated by any modifica modification of Brahmanism. So, after inspecting the manuscripts of the first delivery, he made the decision around June 5th, uh, 5th 1837, to translate the Satama Pundarika Sutra mm -hmm. before the second delivery of the manuscripts on July 14, 1837. So, Yon completed the first draft of a translation of the Satama Pundarika Sutra within a few months even if the final version was realized in 1839 and then its printing in 1841. Yet, despite his initial plan to publish the French translation of the Satama Pundarika Sutra in 1842, Pionov intended to delay its publication 
in order to present the primary leaf and introduction to this work, allowing a sparrow understanding. For example, Pianov stated it in his letter to Theodor Banfe, quote, I have printed the entire French translation of the Lotus of the Good Love. The notes, which are almost complete in manuscript, are still missing, but they will undoubtedly be expanded by future readings. But what occupies me the most is the introduction that I have expanded for this work. It has become a separate work to which I shall give the title of Introduction to the History of Buddhism. In this book, I analyze a great number of the books of Nepal and I compare them with several data borrowed from the books of the Ceylon. End quote. And the introduction to the history of Buddhism was published in 1844 before the publication of the Lotus of the Good Law in 1852, shortly after the death of its author. It is therefore necessary to recognize the primordial role of Hodgson for Pernod's research on Indian Buddhism based on Sanskrit source text. This was certainly the main reason why Pernod wanted to dedicate his translation of the Satama Kundalika Sutra to Hodgson, naming him the founder of the true study of Buddhism through texts and monuments. What then were the reasons for Bionov's choice of the Satama Kundalika Sutra for its complete translation into the French language among the 88 Nepalese Buddhist mm. manuscripts? Several letters from Bionov to Hodgson give some elements of clarification on this subject. In particular, Bionov indicated his preference for the Satama Kundalika Sutta compared to the Pajnaparanika Sutta in 8,000 standards in view of its fastidious repetitive style and lack of doctrinal clarity. One should not think that everything in this book is amusing. On the contrary, the repetitions and the topology are completely fastidious. But this very topology is a very remarkable character and will suit it to the people to whom Buddha was addressing himself, the Prajna Paramita. But what is this? Itself. This is what I could not see anywhere and what I wanted to learn. Anywhere. Concerning the Lalita Vistara Sutta, Yonov wanted to avoid infarging on a translation already begun by Robert Lenz based on manuscripts sent by Hodgson to London. So, I hesitate to engage in the study of the Lalita because I still believe I receive from now and then a thorough analysis of it with partial translation from the hand of my young and unfortunate friend, Dr. Lenz of St. Petersburg. Then, besides these external reasons, 
the professor of Sanskrit literature and the language further expounded in his introduction to the history of Indian Buddhism the positive reasons for his attraction to the It was finally peasants of U.S. stylistic tradition in forms and words and linguistic and chronological divergence between these two styles of writing that attracted Jones' attention, as you can see here. This work is entitled Satama Pandaika. It is composed of two distinct parts, or in fact, two redactions, one in prose and the other in words. These two redactions are intimately interspersed with each other in such a way that when a story or a discourse has been set forth in prose, it is and new in words, sometimes in an average manner, sometimes with developments that add a few things to the first redaction. What makes it even more remarkable is that the poetic parts are widely interspersed with popular forms, sometimes analogous to those of practiced dialects derived from Sanskrit, whether like are Sanskrit are practice standard and also Birnuk nodded the representativeness of the Satama Sutta Sutta as a developed Mahayanic sutra vis a vis the so called simple sutras. So, we are at present in a position not only to compare the sutras, properly speaking, with those of the Mahayana, but to appreciate as well the nature of these resemblances and these differences that bring together or separate these from those called Maha Taitulya or of great development. Thus, the which in regard to form is distinguishes a sutra of the great development, like the sutra Lotus of Good Law, from a single sutra is development and diffusion, but one does not find in this indication of the scene and the framework of the simple sutra anything that recalls the ample and tedious developments that open a great number of developed sutras, an example of which can be seen in the Lotus of the Good Law. Bionov also remarked that the doctrine of the single vehicle, Ikayana, incorporating the pragmatic division of the three modes of salvation expounded in the Satama Pandaika Sutra. So, the Satama Pandaika Sutra, or White Lotus of the Good Law, in addition to the parables it recounts, deals with the most important point of doctrine that was the fundamental unity of the three means a Buddha employs to save humanity from the condition of the present existence. There are not three distant paths of salvation for these three classes of beings named Shavaka, the listeners, Katika Buddhas, or individual Buddhas, and Bodhisattva, or future Buddhas, but there is but one vehicle that, and that if Shaka speaks of three vehicles, it is solely to adjust his teaching to more and less powerful faculties of those who listen to him. Moreover, crises of evolution of Buddhist practices, such as 
the occurrence of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the use of balance, etc., could not escape <laughs> Gilgamesh's insight. But the long enumeration of his virtues introduced some passages analogous to those contained in chapter 24 of the Lotus of Liquid Log, notably those which the various roles that Avalokiteshvara takes on with the intention of converting beings are uh, mentioned appearing for some in the shape of the sun, for others in the shape of the moon, and so on of the main deities. I want to speak of the magical formulas or charms called mantra or dhalanis, which belong properly to the part of Buddhist literature called tantra. These formulas have found a place in the developed sutra and the Lotus of the Good Law, notably as a chapter dedicated to the charms and Bodhisattva promise to the one who possesses the Lotus itself. In short, Gyomo took the Satama Pundarika Sutra to be a specimen of Sanskrit Buddhist literature. To familiarize myself with the idea and with the style that distinguished Buddhist books from other products of Sanskrit literature, I have chosen a work that was accepted as an, an authority in Nepal, and I have translated it for the purpose of later presenting it to the public as a specimen of this still unknown. Unknown literature. Thank you. Thus, the very first European translation of the Satama Pundarika Sutra emerged, although it took several stages until its final publication in 1852. In fact, if the complete Translation of the Satama Pundarika Sutra was achieved in less than two years before July 31st, 1839. The composition of the 149 page notes and that of the 21 treaties relation relating to Buddhism required almost a decade for who also published in the same period the annotated translation of the Bhagavata Brahma in three volumes. By the way, it is quite surprising that a 19th century European scholar had chosen and translated the Satyatma Kundalika Sutra without knowing that its Chinese version was recognized since the Middle Ages as the reference text of the Chinese Chintai Buddhist school and that of the Japanese Nichiren Buddhist school. Indeed, the Chinese translation produced under the direction of the famous Kuchan monk Kumarajira in 406 notably the Myoha Wimwatin or the Myoho Rengegyu in Japanese pronunciation was and still is successful among Far Eastern Buddhists and especially in Japan to the point of being accepted, accepted as an essential component of Japanese culture according to Professor Donnell Robert at the College de France. Now, let us consider the second question about Bion's scientific contribution to Buddhism. From a formal point of view, 
it should be noted that the contemporary photological circles is 647 page of work, introduction to the history of Indianism, is recognized as the first groundbreaking European scientific monograph devoted entirely to Indian Buddhism, that is to say, to history, text, and document, doctrine, as well as offering a French translation of several Sanskrit Buddhist texts. From the methodological point of view, his philological and historical approach, which was the basis of his introduction to the history of Indian Buddhism and his Lotus of the Good Lord, marked a guiding line for the later Buddhas. Starting from the data of Sanskrit Buddhist source text, and not from a second-hand report, Gyono undertook a general objective investigation and critical confrontation of various Buddhist sources available in several languages, in his case, in Pali, in Tibetan, in Sinhala, in Burmese, in Chinese, through Jean-Pierre Abelkanida, and in Mongolian, through Isaac Jacob Schmidt, in order to trace the history of Indian Buddhism. Indeed, the linguistic analysis of Buddhist terminology to which the philologist Gyono paid particular attention was useful in determining the date of the text then and thus in establishing. Buddhist terminology. The use of this method enabled him to grasp, grasp Buddhism as a completely Indian fact, which developed in both the northern and southern region and produced a lot of texts in various forms during different periods. For example, Gyanok pointed out the categorical difference between the simple sutra, the developed sutra, tantra, and their selected translation made in different extra Indian languages. As for the Sanskrit Buddhist text translated by Gurnok, including in particular the Lotus of the Good Law, their accuracy is still appreciated, as Professor Akira Yuyama noted in 2000. Thus, it is undeniable that the orientation taken by Gernot in his Buddhist study in the middle of the 19th century, that is to say, understanding Buddhism from his source text remains to this day one of the most indispensable philological approaches. Now I'd like to propose to review a research case in order to appreciate the ingenuity of Bernard's philological and historical approach. It is about observing how this polyglot genius arrived in three stages at understanding both the meanings of the Indian term Abhat and the fact of its emigration to other countries. One of the first reflections on this Buddhist notion was presented Wise in his work, essay on the Pali or sacred language of the peninsula beyond the Ganges. At first, in a footnote concerning the notion of Bhikkhu, the co authors, Pirno and Lassen, indicated the meaning of the term Abhat, the venerable, and its use as an 
honoring title of the Buddha while being aware of the other two meanings pointed out by Jean-Pierre Abel Kamisa in his translation of the Manhan Shifan Jiao. such as conqueror of enemy. In Tibetan, in Mongolian, and Manchu, and the one who renders to each according to his merit in Chinese. So, the priest, there are two, they are called bhikkhu in Sanskrit, bhikshu, beggar. It is true that there are two orders of priests, and so, the names of Bhikkhu and Rahan would perhaps be used to indicate these differences. As for the word Rahan, it seems to us to be an alteration of the Sanskrit word Arahan, Venerable. This name, in its Sanskrit form, is given in the Buddhist pentagon vocabulary as one of the title of Buddha and it is found in the invocation formula which opens all the Pali books slightly modified in Araha or Arham. Namota Sabhavatu Arahatu Sama Sambudasa in Sanskrit. Namas Tasma Bhagavati Arhati Samyasam Buddhaya. Then in the appendix number three, commentary on the name, uh, names of Buddha, Yono, and Lassen, precise based on the dictionary in Sanskrit and English of Horace Heyman Wilson, that the reading of Arihan was incorrect because the Sanskrit radical of the term was a meaning serving and word code. Considering only the Sanskrit word a is served, be worthy. Arhat means venerable, worthy, and this is the meaning given by Wilson. In Chinese, this interpretation is quite consistent, but it is not so in Manchu, in Mongolian, and in Tibetan. The interpretation given by these three languages is based on an error which indicates a poor knowledge of Sanskrit. The conqueror of enemies is in Sanskrit Arihan, nominative Ariha, from Ati, enemy, and Han to kill. This word, as with Arahan, only a similarity of sound. The remarkable thing is that this error is found in our manuscript where we read Anam Kata Araham, the conqueror of enemies, that is Araham. About 18 years later, Vision Bernard again indicated in his introduction to the history of Indian Buddhism the meaning of the term arhat as part of the four degrees of spiritual, spiritual progression to Nirvana, while pointing out that the presence of the incorrect reading of Harinam Hatha in all Buddhist countries would prove its common and ancient problems. The Arhat, or the Venerable One, has, from the point of view of knowledge, achieved the most elevated degree among monks. Moreover, as according to the text of the Tao, it is through the annihilation of all corruptions of evil that one arrives, according to the Chinese author, the rank of Arhat. 
And it is probably necessary to look into this circumstance for the code of the Boos etymology of the name of hot that the Buddhist of old schools, those of the north, as well as those of the south, propose, and which consist in regarding our heart as synonymous with Arinam Pata, a conqueror of enemies. We already have Mr. Lapsin and myself indicate this uh, no, uh, erroneous interpretation, and I add here that it's present among the Buddhists of all countries to prove that it comes from a single and most certainly ancient source. And finally, in the part of the North, accompanying his translation of the Sakramakundarika Sutta, particularly the of the first chapter of the text, Bionuk added two linguistic references, Sinhalese and Mongolian, in order to point out the Indian origin of the term Arha. He find at the same time as venerable and murderer of the enemy, the term Arha would have been afterwards translated into various languages of Eastern peoples. Quote. So, in his Sinhala dictionary, gives both interpretations, the one provided by Sanskrit grammar and the other adapted by the Buddhist. He derives Arhat, in fact, from Arh merit or from Ahri, the enemy, the passion, and heart. The destroyer. A heart, it says, is one who has completely destroyed pleasure or patience and who consequently is prepared for nirvana. This systemic interpretation of the word a heart, which has its origins in Indian sources, has passed from there into the translation made by the people among whom Buddhism was introduced. Thus, Tibetan uniformly translates the title of heart as Kapchampa, the conqueror of the enemy. The Mongols, either following their example or directly from Sanskrit text, which is less probably, have adapted the same interpretation. The Chinese also know it, and Abel Kandida, in his unpublished translation of the Buddhist pentagonal tabloid, renders the Chinese version of the Sanskrit Arhat as costume developer. In this way, through his philological observation of the notion of Arhat, Bernard arrived at the historical recognition of the diffusion of the Indian Buddhism. This long-term demonstration shows the relevance of the method of critical confrontation of Buddhist source available in different languages for the acquirement of a new knowledge in the middle of the 19th century. At the end of our observations on the Bionic research on Indian Buddhism, we note by way of conclusion that Bionic's two works, notably Introduction à l'histoire du Buddhisme indien and Le Lotus de la Bonne Loi, stand at the origin of the European modern pathology in which 
intellectual reasons predominate and not religious reasons or um, apologetic viewpoint. In particular, the philological and textual approach to Buddhism initiated by Bill Thiel constitutes one of the major axes in Buddhist studies alongside exegetical, philosophical, ethnographic research, etc. Not only in the West, but also in Asia. At the same time, we know that with Professor Donald Lopez, Vision Vyonuk, one of the greatest Indian scholars of the 19th century, had a limited recognition only within the circle of scholars without being well known to the general public. This masterpiece, first published in 1844, is largely neglected today. One might argue that the book has all but disappeared and remains unread and unsent, not because it is outdated or has been superseded, but because it became so fully integrated into the mainstream representation of Buddhism that it's hard to create. There is no longer evil. And yet, I would like to note that the present presentation is based on the recent publication relating to Bernard's research on Northern Buddhism integrated in the collective work. Published under the direction of Professor Pierre Duker in December 2022. This new work available for consultation on the website of the interdis interdisciplinary thematic institute history, sociology, archaeology, and anthropology of religions of the University of Strasbourg will offer um, insight into the life and research of the uh, film. By the way, moreover, its translation of the Prajnaparamita Sutta in 18, uh, sorry, 8,000 standards have recently been published, also thanks to Professor Duker. That brings us to the end of my presentation on Vision Pyramid, who undeniably remains one of the major figures in the history of pathology and Hinduism. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Arigato Kudamisaki.